Hello again, welcome back to uh, A-Level Biology. We're thinking today about biological membranes. Uh, when you look at your specification, it's uh, 2.1.5, biological membranes, the roles of membranes within cells and at the surface of cells, so in other words, membrane uh, function. Um, then we're gonna talk about the fluid mosaic model for membrane structure and its different components. Let's begin with function. Um, so uh, what does the, uh, happens at cell membranes at the surface or what is the point of cell membranes at the surface um, it separates what's inside the cell from what's outside the cell it can help to maintain an environment within a, a cells for example you might want to keep certain chemicals within it um, cell recognition and signaling it has things on the outside um, it has receptors that can uh, new molecules can attach to uh, for example um, it might have a receptor for a particular hormone so that um, when a hormone travels around the body, it attaches to a cell and it makes the cell release or act in a certain way. Um, it keeps the components and metabolic pathways in place. We'll talk about that more in a moment when we look at um, chloroplasts and mitochondria. And it, the classic um, regulating what goes in and what goes out of a cell. So in other words, it helps to control. Um, we'll look at how that is control is done uh, as part of this presentation. Uh, inside a cell, um, if you've got some familiarity of cell organelles, you'll already be, uh, have the idea that um, obviously there are membrane bound organelles. The nuclear envelope is made of cell membrane as is the Golgi body, the rough end of the plasma reticulum and smooth end of the plasma reticulum are all membrane bound. Um, so. Uh, they help to keep the components for a particular reactions within a certain area. They provide lots of folding. Um, default biology answer, if you don't know the answer, say it's highly folded to give a large surface area. You may well get a mark. Uh, and again, it holds components for particular metabolic pathways, flat respiration or photosynthesis in place. Um, so in chloroplasts, um, it provides the site for where photosynthesis takes place in mitochondria for aerobic respiration. And membranes are classically described as partially permeable. In other words, they'll allow some substances through. It's better to talk about molecules or which specific molecules where you can. Um, water and other very small molecules like oxygen, carbon dioxide, are quite small, it can go through. Um, some cells will have special channels to allow things to go through, and we'll look at those channels in more detail in a minute. Um, and then things which are lipid soluble, so in other words, fat soluble, can go through because part of the membrane structure is actually fatty, fatty in itself. Uh, let's look at the membrane in more detail. Now, to understand this, we need to have an understanding of something called a phospholipid. Um, and if you've already covered that in your biochemistry module, great. If you haven't, we're going to just talk briefly about what a phospholipid is. So you can see the component parts, the phosphate group. No surprises there for those of you who've been studying DNA. Um, it's a phosphate group. Then it has uh, two components, a hydrophilic part and a hydrophobic part. What does hydrophilic and hydrophobic mean? Well, phobia is fear of something. So I am arachnophobic. I am terrified of spiders. Hydrophobic means it doesn't like water. Hydrophilic, philia is liking. So hydrophilic likes something. Um, and when you put them near water, they behave in a certain way. Now, the bit that is hydrophilic will happily sit in water. The bit that is hydrophobic likes to be away from water. So if you put a thin layer of lipid, uh, phospholipid near water, then it will do this. And these bits are classically described as um, heads and tails because of the uh, sort of similarity or structure to their shape. Um, now, um, phospholipids, it says are made from phosphate. We've met this molecule here is glycerol. And this is a fatty acid. What it really means is this is a long repeating chain or hydrocarbon chain of carbons attached to hydrogen. So they've simplified it here as just a jagged line, but it's carbon with hydrogen att attached to either end and a long repeating chain of it. And there are two of these chains. Um, now, we've mentioned hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Um, the reasons they are hydrophilic and hydrophobic is to do with whether they are polar or nonpolar. 
polar things have a spread or distribution of charge, so they've got a positive and a minus end, whereas um, non-polar have an even distribution of charge uh, and therefore are, have charge through across, or distributed all the way across them. So there's no bit that is positive or negative, there's just charge everywhere, if you like. So um, things which therefore are polar will tend to like being near other polar things, non-polar things are, are similarly will we'll tend to not mix. So the basic idea however is if uh, oil and water don't mix, so if you pour oily substances onto watery things they form a layer. This is what's happening here, they're forming a layer. Now the size of the layer will depend on the size of the substances you have um, and then you can have some more complex structures and these are kind of models to get you to think about how um, a cell might occur. With small amounts of uh, phospholipid, you get something called a micelle, a ball, where all the uh, hydrophobic tails are inside and all the hydrophilic heads are on the outside. If you have sufficient, they might form a double layer, what we call a bilayer, and that can be in a sheet or a ball, this liposome. And if you get a big enough sheet, then you can make a big enough ball. And that's just really what a cell is. It's a big ball of phospholipids in a double layer, which helps to separate it from watery substances. Because both the external sur the surface outside the cell will be watery, and also there's a watery solution within the cytoplasm. So the tails don't want to be near either of those sets of watery substances. So they're hidden or contained within the um, cell membrane structure. Now, Principally, the whole sort of shape of these things uh, helps to give them stability and structure. If you might think about um, a set of ping pong balls are sort of distributed across water. If you've got enough of them packed tightly together, then they're not going to move very much. They will if you wobble the water, they will bob about and the balls might move a little bit, but they can't move easily. And there's other things in the membrane as well, which helps to give it more stability. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. So there's our phospholipid bilayer. Now notice there is, uh, again, we've got the phosphates at the heads at the top and the fatty acid tails at the bottom. Here's an electron micrograph. Uh, it's a transmission electron micrograph because it's 2D image, black and white, not three-dimensional scanning. Um, and you can see sort of the two distinct bands of which might show you that there's a phospholipid bilayer. So this helps to sort of see that, show that sort of distinctive layer, layer there. Uh, classically, seven to 10 nanometers thick. So we're not talking micrometers. Micrometers is uh, whole organelles. Nanometers, we're talking of much smaller scale because these things will make up part of an organelle. The Singer-Nicholson model. This is the classic model that we still use today of what a cell uh, membrane is like. We've seen that we've got our phospholipid bilayer, but it's called the fluid mosaic model for a reason. It's because it has a fluid pattern of phospholipids that can move around a little bit, and then studded within those is a mosaic or a pattern of proteins. Uh, and there are many different types, or several different types. You can have channel proteins or pore proteins. Uh, you have these things which are glycoproteins. In other words, it's got a carbohydrate group attached to uh, the protein. And you can have glycolipids, where you've got a carbohydrate group attached to the lipid instead of the protein. To help to give the uh, membrane stability, you have cholesterol distributed in um, small amounts throughout it. And then Underneath there, you might have the cytoskeleton, so actin, for some of the microfilament is part of the cytoskeleton, which might attach some of the proteins in place to give it, again, a little bit more stability and shape. Well, it's been around nearly as long as I have, 1972, uh, so that makes it about just over 40 years old, just like me, uh, and so it's been around a while. Let's look at the uh, different components in turn. Phospholipids, um, it says selectively permeable because substances which are dissolved in fats can easily move through them. Substances which are watery can less easily move through them. Um, 
so it makes it more difficult for watery substances to move through them. Things which are highly charged can't move through them and need ways of being able to get through. So channel proteins are present to allow really charged particles, ions, things which have a very definite positive or very definite negative charge, and allow them easily to move through. There are also carrier proteins, and we'll talk more about those in a subsequent presentation, but they are used for active transport. The glycoproteins are sites of cell recognition, hormone receptors, we've mentioned before, but also can act to bind cells together. The glycolipids, again, can also be for cell recognition and hormone receptors. When I say cell recognition, I'm thinking about bodies being able to recognise cells as part of themselves. If your body doesn't recognise your own cell as part of yourself, that's what we call autoimmune disease. So in other words, where you get conditions where your immune system attacks your own body cells, that's not good. You want your body to be able to recognise your own cells and also to be able to recognise foreign invaders as foreign invaders. In other words, if you've got a bacteria that invades you, you want to, your body to be able to recognise that this is not part of you and produce an immune response. Uh, membranes can sometimes be differentiated, have different structures. Uh, think about the neuron, for example. Uh, this has loads of carrier and ch uh, channel proteins that's responsible for producing the, what we call the electrical impulse, the wave of electricity that moves in a message from one place to another. Uh, in root hair cells, again, there are lots and lots of carrier uh, proteins because it needs to take in mineral ions against its concentration gradient, active transport. Uh, similarly, um, white blood cells might have specific proteins that recognise um, foreign invading cells on their surfaces, so they need to have those adaptations. Okay, um, your final sort of bit of this presentation. Here's a, a quick question for you. What is the name given to the model uh, of this membrane structure shown? And what are the components shown as A, B, C and D? Um, I suggest you pause this uh, video now. I'm not going to give the answers in this presentation. They'll come in this next subsequent presentation just so you can test yourself and check your understanding. Okay, hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for listening.